the broadcast of the regular meeting of the Heritage Preservation Commission will now begin. Good afternoon. Welcome to this live broadcast of our virtual meeting of the May 4th, 2021 regular meeting of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. This meeting includes the remote participation of members as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.021 due to the declared local health pandemic. For the record, my name is Madeline Sundberg and I serve as chair of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. I will now call this meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll so we may verify the presence of a quorum. Bjornberg. Present. Booty. Present. Howard. Present. Nelson. Present. Nystrom. Present. And Bolt. Present. Sadie. Here. Brothers. Sundberg. Present. Anderike. Here. That's nine, nine members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect we do have quorum. With that, we will proceed to our agenda, a copy of which was posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system, which is available at lims.minneapolismn.gov. Our first order of business is to adopt the agenda for this meeting. We'll work from the agendas that are available online. I will go through the agenda and sort out what items will be continued to a future meeting, what items will be discussed, and what items will be put on a consent agenda to be approved as recommended by staff without further discussion. Our first item, item number four, is 1018 4th Street Southeast Ward 3. This is a demolition of a historic resource. This item will be discussed. Item number five is a historic waiver text amendment to chapter 599, and that item will be discussed. Um, so the proposed agenda is item four, 1018 4th Street Southeast. We'll have a staff presentation, public comment, commission discussion and action. And item five, the historic waiver text amendment, will have a staff presentation and commission discussion and action. Commissioners, may I have a motion to uh, approve the proposed agenda? Johnson moves. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Is there a second? Bjornberg seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Bjornberg. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion. Bjornberg. Aye. Booty. Aye. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Sample. Aye. Eighty. Aye. Struthers. Sunberg. Aye. Anderike. Aye. That's nine yeas and zero nays. Thank you. The agenda is approved. Our next order of business will be to approve the minutes from our March 16th, 2021 meeting. May I have a motion to approve those minutes? Commissioner Johnson moves. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Is there a second? Sandbolt, second. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. Any discussion? With that I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion. Bjornberg. Aye. Booty. Aye. Howard. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Sambolt. Aye. Aye. 
Aye. Struthers. Sundberg. Aye. Vandreich. Aye. Nine yeas and zero nays. Thank you, the minutes are approved. Before I open the hearing to public comments, let me summarize the process for conducting the public hearing in this virtual format. We'll take each agenda item in order. First, planning staff will present its report and commissioners may ask questions of staff. Then we'll hear from the applicant and commissioners may ask questions of the applicant. After that, I will open the public hearing and invite public comment. Uh, we'll be taking speakers in the order they pre-registered. Speakers will be limited to two minutes. We ask that after your name is called, you state your name and address for the record and then proceed to your comments. After we've completed the list of any pre-registered speakers, I'll check to see if there are any other speakers in the queue who may have called in. In order to activate your microphone, you'll need to press star six on your phone and then wait to hear the recorded message before you begin talking. Um, so again, we'll take the list of pre-registered speakers in order and then open the uh, floor to any other speakers who may be in the queue. Um, please keep your comments to the specific application before us today. After the public comments are complete, I will close the hearing. Commissioners will deliberate and act on the application before us. So our first item, number four, is 1018 4th Street Southeast, Ward 3. This is a demolition of a historic resource, and the staff report will be presented by Rob Sklecki. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Rob Sklecki, City Planner in the Historic Preservation section of CPED. Today I'm presenting a de demolition of historic resource application for the property located at 1018 4th Street Southeast. It's historically known as the Dr. William Condit residence. Next slide, please. The subject property is, in, is a two and a half to three story frame dwelling constructed in 1902 for William H. Condit, who was a doctor and surgeon. The building was designed by master architect William Kenyon in the neoclassical or classical revival style. It was built by John Bowes, who's a local contractor. The building shows characteristic classical elements, which are most noticeable in the large two story pedimented uh, portico and Corinthian columns at the front elevation as well as cornice dentils and decorative corner pilasters at all elevations. The property appears to retain most original windows, which include 12 over 1, 9 over 1, 9 over 9, 6 over 1, all of these double hung sash and some multi-light fixed um, or casement windows. Next slide, please. The building was first identified in 2002 to 2003 by the consultant Landscape Research LLC as part of the designation study for the University of Minnesota Greek Letter Chapter House Historic District. The consultant noted that 1018 4th Street Southeast was an excellent example of a private residence that was converted to Greek Chapter House use. Although the building was not resurveyed or recommended for potential local designation or National Register listing in the more recent historic resources in the Central Core Area Inventory, which was completed in 2011 by Mead and Hunt. CEPA did determine the property to be a historic resource through an August 2020 historic review letter, which noted that the property appeared to be eligible for landmark designation under Criterion 6 for work of a master architect as a notable example of a William Kenyon designed neoclassical house. Under Criterion 3 as a good example of a dwelling type that's emblematic of residential dinky town and under Criterion 1 for the dwellings connection to the University of Minnesota uh, rising enrollment and associated growth of the area in the early 20th century. The building was also noted in the recent 2020 Mary Lochran Student Rooming Homes Historic District Designation Study uh, since the Condit residence exists across the intersection of 11th Avenue Southeast and 4th Street Southeast. Uh, you can see here on the map the location of the Condit residence in relation to um, the Lochran Homes, which exist at 1103 4th Street Southeast, 410 11th Avenue Southeast, and 406 11th Avenue Southeast. Um, these properties communicate a very similar history. Uh, the subject dwelling was designed by William Kenyon, like the Lochran Homes, and it was constructed actually year following the designated Mary Lochran Student Rooming Homes. Um, all these dwellings share a very similar development and tenant history that's really characteristic of residential Adinky Town. Uh, the subject building, the, the Condit residence, like the Lochran Homes, is a property with very close ties to the University of Minnesota 
and it's a dwelling that served as uh, rooming for student organizations, um, housing for student organizations, um, as well as student rumors for much of its existence, um, actually up until recently from what I understand. Next slide, please. The Department of Community Planning and Economic Development has analyzed the application to allow for the demolition of the building located at 1018 4th Street Southeast based on the following findings. Um, in CPA's review, the subject property appears to be not eligible for local designation when looking at significance. Staff finds that the property doesn't have adequate significance under criteria one to merit potential individual local designation. Uh, as we stated, the, the property is characteristic of the growth of the University of Minnesota and the associated growth of housing for students and university-based clientele. Um, while the dwelling appears to be a good example to associate with the social history, the building has lost integrity through substantial alterations to elevation siding. Um, also, the city, like stated previously, has already designated the Mary Lock on Student Rooming Homes Historic District and the University of Minnesota Greek Letter Chapter House Historic District. Uh, which both retain greater historic integrity and each of them as a collection of properties are better able to communicate um, this history of housing tied to the University of Minnesota and the Dinkytown area. CFED staff also finds that the property is not eligible under Criterion 3 since grand homes designed by prominent Minneapolitans which transition to student rooming, fraternity or sorority use are emblematic of the residential history of Dinkytown and the University of Minnesota area. Um, the building does not appear to retain significant, uh, sufficient integrity to be eligible for designation under this criterion as an individual landmark. Staff also finds the property does not hold enough significance to be eligible under criterion six. Um, the property was built by William N. Kenyon, who is a master architect, and it appears to be an example of Kenyon's vast implementation of various revival styles of that era. Um, although the building's original design is a good example of Kenyon's implementation of the neoclassical style, the building, as stated again previously, has lost integrity through alterations. Um, additionally, I'll note that Kenyon designed the 1908 second story addition and facade enlargement of the Farmers and Mechanics Savings Bank, which is a classical influence Beaux-Arts building that is already local, locally designated by the city individually for its architectural significance. Um, with all this considered, staff did identify the property as a historic resource in a 2020 historic review letter, but further consideration of the potential significance for the site has been assessed and staff finds that the property doesn't hold enough significance that could allow the property to be worthy of landmark designation. Um, this is due to the overall condition and integrity of the building, as well as the fact that the city has already two historic districts designated in this neighborhood, which cover very similar building types and tenant histories. Um, in addition, multiple neoclassical, classical revival or Beaux-Arts buildings that are better examples of their respective histories are already individual landmarks or um, included as part of historic districts designated by the city. Next slide, please. The subject property does not retain the integrity required um, to be an individual landmark. While location setting, uh, feeling and association are all adequate, the property has noticeably lost integrity in design, materials and workmanship. Um, as mentioned, the property has been altered with the removal of all original exterior cladding, the replacement with um, the asbestos siding, which has impacted the building. Um, also a three-story entry and egress stairway structure has been added to the full side or east southeast elevation that accesses a non-historic entry at the attic level. Um, windows and all decorative elements appear to be original and intact, but the building overall does not appear to retain enough integrity to be considered for individual designation under its relevant criteria. The applicant has demonstrated th that the property may be in an unsafe condition through submitted reports to show hazardous materials found at the property. Um, a structural engineer's report pointed to cracking at the interior walls um, and potential for collapse of one of the leaning front columns that you can see, um, I believe here in the photo. Um, the report did conclude that the building was in hazardous condition and recommended reinforcement as soon as possible. Um, additionally, lead, asbestos and mold levels that appear to be common for vacant buildings of this era were identified in an additional submitted report. Um, it's estimated that multiple areas of lead-based paint in poor condition, 
mold due to water infiltration. Um, these would require mitigation efforts and any potential projects to facilitate a reuse of the property. Um, the applicant has submitted an app, uh, estimate for potential rehabilitation of the building, which could address some of these mentioned unsafe conditions. Um, while rehabilitation of the property does seem possible to mitigate these property hazards, um, submitted documents support that this might be reasonably or feasible, uh, feasibly difficult to complete. Um, with that being said, given currently available research, the property does not appear to be individually eligible for local designation. The Department of Community Planning and Economic Development recommends that the Heritage Preservation Commission adopt staff findings for the application by William Wells for the property located at 1018 4th Street Southeast and recommend um, the motion to approve the demolition of historic resource application. Um, and with that, I'm available for any questions as staff, but I do understand that the applicant and I think the property owner as well are here and are available for questions too. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? Commissioner Howard. Hi, um, is there any potential for a historic district that would include Thanks, Commissioner Howard. I'll, I'll note too that there's a bit of a issue with your audio. So I, th I think I caught your question. Um, staff did look at it for potentially inclusion into a historic district. Um, you know, as we stated, it was studied as early as uh, 2002 to be included um, in the Greek letter after house historic district, and it was not included for that. Um, in the Mary Loughran Homes historic district uh, designation study, it was mentioned just based on the fact that, you know, it, it has a very similar resident history. It has a very similar history of being developed for a prominent um, area, Minneapolitan, and then quickly transitioning to student rooming. Um, but there was less, I guess, cohesive of an identity um, between these this property and the district. So, you know, the district, it was identified as, as six homes on a, on a parcel that share the same owner, builder, William Kenyon architect. Um, and, you know, it was something that was considered, but it wasn't something that was, um, you know, we saw a serious link between that would warrant designation as a district for that. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? don't see any at this time. Thank you, Rob. Um, I will now open the public hearing for this item. I believe the applicant is here to speak. Um, I think it's William Wells. If you'd like to press star six on your phone and wait to hear the recorded message to activate your microphone so we can hear you and then state your name and address for the record. Good evening, commissioners. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, good evening. My name is William Wells. I am the applicant in this project. I am also an architect. I am joined this evening also on the phone by the Javelin Group. They are the environmental consultant. They are available for answering questions. They did testing and provided a report. I'm also joined by the structural engineer who is available for questions. Uh, the contractor is on the line and the owner. So people are available for questions as needed. I was hired by the owner approximately uh, six months ago to assess the existing conditions of the house and provide the owner with options for uh, repairs and rehabilitation of the property. We uh, hired consultants that provided their own reports and uh, that information was then provided to the contractor for pricing 
and the pricing was given to the owner and that all that information is in front of you tonight. I did submit updated photos that I took recently. Uh, the photos that staff showed you tonight show snow on the ground. I took photos very recently of the property that I would like to go through and just talk about the existing conditions, what's out there on site, uh, the environmental and structural failures of this building are very serious. So I think the photos that I took and emailed in uh, do show the commissioners some updated and more current uh, photos. Is that something that we can show? Can the clerk show that? Yes, we have one of the side of the building up. I think it's the first photo you sent. Yes, there are nine photos. These are updated photos that I took. Uh, it does show the, if you're looking at the building and you're seeing the orange postings on the front of the building, then you are looking at the correct photo. So this site is a rooming house and it currently does not comply with the zoning code. There are many zoning uh, problems with this building. There's parking in the front yard, which is not allowed under the zoning code. The rooming house designation is not allowed. You've got an emergency egress on the side of the building that is crossing the property line, which is also not allowed. So we've got some zoning issues, you know, just looking overall at the property, some very serious zoning issues. And then uh, going around the building, if we can just start to look a little closer, I'm on page two, looking at the front porch, you can see that the front porch is failing. There's a photo on page two showing that the foundation is uh, on the front of the building is just sort of starting to collapse inward to the building. So all the rainwater from the front porch is actually running into the building. And that is leading to uh, some serious water damage in the uh, basement and uh, it's causing cracking and it's causing a lot of problems on the front of the building there. I'm now looking at the second uh, the third page and the third photo I'm looking at uh, a stairwell down to the basement. You can see once again, the water damage is very serious and significant. The foundation wall is beginning to crack. The house is starting to sort of slide a little bit in the foundation wall down there. You can see where all the leaves are and there's a little puddle of water that's collecting. So there's some really serious water infiltration issues around this building. You can see that the foundation wall is not it's, it's not waterproofed. So looking at um, on the fourth page now, there's a close up view on page number four. The photo I took shows just a real close up view of the foundation wall where there, there's a hole in the foundation wall. This foundation wall uh, is hundred more than a hundred years old limestone wall that is crumbling and falling apart. And it's kind of at the end of its life and it's, it's very serious what the uh, foundation damages, mostly from water, but you can see that it's just cracking very seriously. On page five, there's a close-up view of the column on the front of the building that's beginning to fail. There's some very serious water damage that's happening on the front of the building. And that column is one thing that the structural engineer and I are very concerned about because it's really starting to lean and there is a potential for collapse possibly within the next year. So that that is something the owner is very concerned about the life and safety hazards of that. I'm on page six now, looking at a close-up photo, of sort of how the house meets the foundation wall. You can see uh, the water infiltration, the damage, the siding, and uh, the seriousness of sort of the building starting to lean and move. Page seven of the photo number seven on page seven of nine shows the exterior window, the detailed exterior window you can see that there's uh, the rot and damage around the windows, very serious. And it's not just a matter of replacing the window. Really, that's not the scope of the work. All of the windows, all of the framing, all of the jams in this house have serious water damage and structural failures. So it's not just the scope of work is not just replace the windows. You have to rebuild the entire window frame, new headers to code. It's a lot of work. And that's uh, important that people understand the full scope and the full damage that's happening out there. Page eight, photo number eight of nine, is just another close up of the windows. There's another window on the other side of the house. There's literally a gap. There's a gap between the window and the sheathing. And you're kind of seeing into the wall and the water is going into the wall. 
right there. And what's happening is the house is sort of splitting apart because there's structural failures. Now you get things pulling apart and water going into the building. That's, that's a big problem out there, what's happening. Not just in the foundation, but everywhere on the windows. So, you know, part of the reason the, at the neighborhood group meeting, they were asking me, why is the pricing so high? Well, I'm trying to give you more details and specifics because the contractor has to rebuild this building. They have to reframe every window, new headers. And I'm on page nine now. This is the last photo that I wanted to show tonight. Just another close up of the window. You can see the windows pulling away from the building separation. So looking back to page number one, photo number one, the overall scope of this project and in terms of rehabbing it, in terms of the mechanical system, the structural system, the electrical system, it's not just paint on the walls and a new boiler, which somebody mentioned at the neighborhood group meeting. That's not the scope of the work. The scope of the work is very, very serious and very extensive. You're talking about a rebuilding of this property. The third floor system in this building is built out of two by fours. The floor is built out of two by fours and it bounces and there's holes in it. It's unsafe. This building is unsafe. Nobody's living in it. Nobody's lived in it for almost two years because it's so unsafe. There's so many failures everywhere on the building that it's unlivable. So you have an unlivable structure that is starting to twist and fail and collapse and there's serious water damage. So in terms of uh, this, it does say in the staff report that this is not necessarily a rehab. This is a rebuilding of the property is what we would have to do. And that's what the contractor priced because that's the extent of the work. So if you imagine this property being sort of uh, rebuilt, you've, you've demoed all the asbestos siding, you've demoed all lath and plaster, you've demoed the roof, the third floor system, the front columns, that stair system, most of the foundation wall, you're left with nothing at that point. There's nothing left of, of the building. So I know that the NARA group in their letter were very concerned about demoing the house and rebuilding something new on the site because they said it causes waste. But even a rebuilding of the property, is there's going to be extensive waste in, in either option of rebuilding or building something new on the site there's virtually the same amount of construction waste that's gonna happen on this site. So what I'd like to do right now is just turn it over to the Javelin group. I'd like them to explain what testing they did, the environmental issues and um, what they found on site in their test reports. And then I'd like the structural engineer to just talk briefly. Hi, this is uh, John Finlay. I'm with the Javelin Group. We're the environmental consultant uh, on this project. And uh, our scope of work was to basically do an asbestos survey of the building, uh, lead-based paint inspection, and also um, observations for uh, visual evidence of mold in the building. <clears throat> uh, in that process, we um, went to the building. I think we did the work in January of this year. And um, when we were doing the asbestos survey, we went through and collected bulk samples of what we consider suspect asbestos containing materials in the building, things like uh, plaster and the transite siding and insulation, uh, linoleum and floor tiles, those kinds of materials that are often contain asbestos. <clears throat> and um, in that process, we collected 41 bulk samples of materials and uh, that were suspect materials. Um, this was not a this was a non-destructive uh, asbestos survey, so we didn't open up walls to find other materials. Um, we basically just collected samples of materials that were readily accessible. In that, we identified, as uh, William had indicated earlier, that the transite siding on the exterior of the building, about 5,100 square feet, um, which contains 20% chrysotile asbestos, um, is on all four sides of the building. Um, the condition at the time was in fair condition with some damage and and um, if it if it's required to be disturbed uh, either through removal um, then it would have to be abated by a licensed asbestos abatement contractor it's required under state and federal laws to remain in good condition um, otherwise it needs to be repaired or removed uh, we also identified some um, paper insulation in one of the closets of um, of the building uh, this kind of material is oftentimes uh, behind walls, um, uses an insulation paper, 
and it may be throughout the building. Again, we didn't do uh, destructive testing to see if it's there, but it um, was visible in, um, in the closet, and that contained a 60% chrysotile asbestos. In addition, some of the windows, um, we identified two. We didn't sample all the windows because of uh, the higher windows didn't really have good access. And uh, we found uh, the glazing on windows, which is another uh, common asbestos containing material, um, was hot for asbestos. They had 4% chrysotile. Anything greater than 1% is considered an asbestos containing material. Those um, materials were in poor condition. And again, as I indicated before, state and federal regs require if it's in damaged condition, needs to be repaired or removed. Um, so that it doesn't release asbestos fibers um, that can be inhaled. Um, those were the materials that we identified in our survey for asbestos containing materials uh, in the building. They're, like I said, likely other areas inside walls um, um, that, or additional windows that likely would have um, additional asbestos containing materials. Uh, secondly, we did a lead-based paint inspection. We collected, tested 248 different painted components or coated surfaces in the building for lead using a field um, XRF analyzer. And anything greater than one milligram of lead per square centimeter is classified as lead-based paint under state and federal regulations. We identified uh, uh, a lot of materials as kind of what expected. Lead paint was banned in 1978. Um, from most cases, and um, so this is being an older building, it's um, not unusual to find a lot of lead-based paint. A lot of it was in poor condition. Again, if it's in poor condition, then um, it can re, um, release lead dust, which is a hazard to children uh, under the age of six primarily. And um, due to uh, uh, intake, we did not do um, lead dust sampling, which is often required in buildings because uh, dust is the most common um, way that lead is ingested. And um, based on the lead paint being in poor condition in numerous areas, areas of the building, um, there's likely uh, elevated lead dust on floors and horizontal surfaces in the building too. Um, the windows throughout the building uh, had lead paint on them, uh, crown molding on the first floor, uh, the exterior, North and south walls in poor condition with lead, lead paint, the wood trim in the exterior, the round, front round columns, again, in poor condition, were painted with lead paint. Um, the walls and ceiling in the rear stairwell were um, intact to poor condition with lead paint. The baseboards throughout the residence um, contained lead-based paint. The stair treads, the stringers, the risers all contained lead paint in uh, poor uh, condition primarily. Door casings um, were in poor to intact condition. So a lot of lead-based paint in the building um, um, that um, even if it's not occupied by children in the future, um, OSHA requires that contractors who are working with materials that have lead paint have to follow OSHA requirements and make sure that they're not exposing their workers um, above the permissible exposure limit for airborne lead. Um, and finally, we also did a, a, a visual for mold in the building. Uh, we noticed several areas of water staining and wood rot and, and evidence of uh, mold um, in those areas. A lot of times, mold's not visible on the surface. It's behind the walls where the mold is. It may be wet, but it tends to grow all the time in the backside of drywall on the backside of wall surfaces. Um, you'll see some evidence sometimes in the front, and then you open up the wall and there's mold all on the backside of the um, wall, wall assemblies. Um, so again, as and I'm sure the conditions are worse now as more water gets into the building. Uh, mold is ubiquitous, it's an airborne spore, and if there's the right substrate like plaster or drywall, those kinds of materials, and there's moisture, mold will grow. And so I'm sure since we did this in January, um, as warmer conditions, um, um, Increase here in the beginning of spring, we're going to see a lot more mold growing in the building because of all the moisture that's continued to, to come in. Um, basically, that was what our um, observations were. It's um, com uh, very common for us to see this kind of uh, situation in a vacant older building. Uh, we do a lot of uh, these assessments in buildings, and um, as the buildings become vacant, water moves in. The, uh, plaster uh, starts to um, have problems, the paint starts to peel, and um, asbestos containing materials that are damaged from water or weathering um, will continue to make the situation worse in the building. It's quite expensive to remove all these materials. Um, 
and, uh, and 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 especially a lot of these that might um, that are like cornices and pieces like that that you would want to save if you were saving the building um, that have to be um, scraped off or removed with uh, paint remover. Um, you can't just com uh, remove the the pieces themselves uh, in a in, in a very cost effective way. Um, anyway, that's uh, kind of our summary of the report. I don't know if there's any questions, but I'll pass it back to William. Thank you. I think Commissioner Johnson does have a quick question. I actually sure. do. Um, you know, I know we're talking a lot about ACM and lead-based paint and potentially mold, um, and that the costs are very high to abate it. Um, but you know, even if this HPC grants the application for demolition, those are you still need to abate those things before you demolish the building. Is uh, isn't that correct? And can you speak to um, that? You, you, um, you would have to remove the asbestos containing materials. You do not have to remove the lead-based paint or the mold. So it would be, um, um, there would be the asbestos containing materials would have to be abated if they become friable during the uh, demolition process. And in, in most cases, we would always recommend the, that they be removed. But again, lead-based paint, um, no longer is required to be removed during demolition. And same with uh, mold is not required to be removed during demolition. Thank you. Yep. Um, Thank you. you is, is the structural engineer on the line? Could the structural engineer talk about the failures in the building briefly? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is uh, Mark Hostetler and I'm a structural engineer. I uh, inspected the uh, building uh, earlier this year and uh, found a lot of wall cracks and ceiling cracks. Uh, that's an indication that the building has been moving and it's also an indication that um, it, it's probably still moving. Uh, the, the cracks are very wide, uh, meaning that the, um, the structure is really technically not stable. Uh, and and uh, with the foundation, uh, deteriorating the way it is and other elements that I found that uh, were cracking, I would expect that to continue. Uh, and eventually uh, there could be a failure. Uh, trying to uh, locate all the sources of uh, the movement. Uh, again, the foundation would be a big item to stabilize. Uh, the um, the framework ex itself uh, would have to be opened up and examined closely and, and uh, elements that are cracked, uh, beams or joists or columns uh, would have to be replaced or fortified. Uh, so there would be a lot of work in, in bringing it back, especially the foundation. That's, that's a tough item to, to rehabilitate. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I think the neighborhood group had a lot of questions and concerns about the cost, and we're trying to get our hands around the scope of the work for everybody and explain the cost. It might be helpful for the commissioners to hear from the contractor to sort of go through what some of the big ticket line items are and how we got to this price. We did walk through a lot of subs to make sure that the numbers were accurate. Would it be helpful for the commission to hear from the contractor and go through some of the line items? Yes, if the if the contractor would like to give a statement also. Thank you. I think we can hear okay. you sound kind of echoey. Okay. Um, hang on, let me just try this. took off my ear pods. Um, my name is Matt Masnick. I'm a project manager for uh, Homes by Tradition. Um, we were approached by uh, William Wells Architects and the owner of this property to uh, take a look at the uh, possibility of repairing and renovating the property. Um, we do have worked for William in the past on other projects, so he uh, reached out to us. He created a 10-page specification that he presented to us, 
and in early February, we uh, actually had an on-site meeting, had time set up, appointments set up with the various uh, trade contractors that work for us to come through and uh, physically visit the property, walk through it, tour it, so that they could uh, provide adequate uh, costs or proposed costs to perform the work that uh, Wells and Company, William Wells and Company had presented. Uh, then uh, once we assembled that after about three weeks, we presented those numbers to William Wells uh, and the ownership group. And that's how we uh, got to our numbers that we have here. And uh, yes, some of the higher numbers are, are uh, for example, demolition number was a pretty high line item, but that included all types of abatement based on the reports, the environmental work with regards to lead paint, so on and so forth. So we did have two different environmental contractors come down and take a look at the at the entire site, uh, so on and so forth. Um, our biggest concern is, 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 is the one thing in the specs is, is all that this price seems high. Um, my concern as a contractor is that, that it's not high enough. We, we put all this work into this building and still have a foundation that is in very bad shape on this building. So I guess that's kind of where we're at, how we got to where we're at today. Um, any questions uh, for us? Thank you. Are there any questions for the contractor? I don't see any at this time. Um, okay. Did the owner also wish to make a statement? I think they're signed up also. Hi, uh, my name is Blake Bonavine. I'm the owner of the property. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I really don't know where to begin. I bought the property here at 1018, gosh, 20 years ago. And um, we've been running it as a rooming house for the past, you know, up to oh, three years ago. And it's been slowly deteriorating. And so we decided three years ago that we were going to dig in and go into a major renovation mode. And when we did that, <laughs> we spent two years going through the property and it, one thing kept leading to another as far as the repairs go that I finally, after sitting there vacant and looking at it for two years, I didn't know what my options were. So I reached out to William to kind of see if there was another avenue. And that's kind of where we ended up here. Our original idea was just to renovate the place. And it was a complete, one thing after another kept popping up. And so I think the best thing to do was to potentially demo it. And that's how we arrived at this meeting today. And I'll take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for the owner? Any questions for the design team in general? don't see any questions at this time. Uh, thank you all for your statements. Thank you. Um, thank you. So at this time, um, we've gone through everybody who is pre-registered, but I would like to check to see if there is anyone who is in the queue who wished to speak for or against this application um, <clears throat> and, and didn't pre-register. If you could press uh, star six and let me know that you are there. I don't see anybody else. Um, so seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Um, commissioners, let's discuss this application. Are there any concerns or comments? I know it's always sad to see one like this go. Um, Commissioner Howard. Can you hear me now? Yes. For some reason, Teams doesn't like my other headphones, so I'll just stick with my old earbuds. Um, I, I appreciated uh, staff response to my question about a district. I'm, I'm very concerned about the way that we've kind of approached this whole area. Uh, we've expressed concern in the past related to the 
the last district that we just uh, recommended for designation. Um, I, I do agree with staff. This is not a property that would be individually eligible, in my opinion, basically because of uh, integrity, if nothing else. Uh, I don't know that doing a study would show that it would be individually eligible for, for landmarking. Um, and it is quite a, a, a ways. It's not that far from the district we just nominated, but there's some pretty major intrusions between this property and the, the district that we just looked at. So I'm really curious to know what other uh, commissioners think about this. Um, uh, it's it's always a struggle, like you said, it's always a struggle when we're talking about demolition. Um, and I know that the neighborhood has some very valid concerns. So I'm curious to know what other commissioners think. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Um, Yes, I, I think I agree with you that the integrity alone was really the, the issue I was bumping into is that it's um, it, it seemed to me that the, the description as it was really more of a rebuild versus a rehabilitation seemed accurate with the level of alteration that would be needed to make it code compliant. Um, Commissioner Johnson. Yeah, I, I actually, I was, you stole my thunder because um, I was going to say the amount of effort and work that's going to take into making this home um, livable again and bringing it up to code. By the time all the work is done, there's there's going to be nothing left of the, you know, original building. Um, so I, 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 um, I hate to, you know, demolish a, a building by a master architect, but I, I think I'm definitely leaning towards uh, agreeing with staff recommendations on this one. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Um, any other thoughts on this application? I did appreciate the um, neighborhood's concerns and I you know, as many of us have, have jobs in the preservation field, the idea that the greenest building is the one that is already built is, is certainly something I, I feel strongly about. Um, I think that issue gets uh, further complicated when you have um, issues with things like asbestos um, because, um, you know, the, it requires wholesale removal of those parts. And um, when it's the entire exterior of the building, that's, that's just kind of a hard place to be. Um, Commissioner Sandbolt. Hi, I'm going to go ahead and say that I agree with staff findings, um, and I I believe that this this property is not a historic resource, and our job as a Heritage Preservation Commission isn't to really weigh in on you know the existing building green and as much as I agree that we should save materials as much as possible. I just don't think that I can look at this application and see that this is a historic resource. It's been looked at to be part of a district and was decided not to be included in a district. I think this has been looked at a couple of times and I'd be on the side of saying, oh, agreeing with staff findings and saying that this is not a historic resource. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbold. Commissioner Nystrom. I feel like I'm now just echoing everybody else, but I agree. Um, it's unfortunate because I have driven past this house hundreds of times and it's beautiful, but with all of the issues um, that we saw and we've read about um, and exactly what Commissioner Johnson said, I mean, it's, it, once you do all of that to rebuild it, it's no longer gonna be um, that really historic house. So um, I am finding myself to agree with staff findings as well, even though I'm sad to see it go. Would anyone like to make a motion? Commissioner Stady. Uh, I would like to move to approve the demolition of the historic resource application for 1018 4th Street Southeast in as written in our agenda. 
Thank you. I'm just checking the agenda to make sure that we don't have to say anything more than that. Um, I think that's sufficient. Thank you. Is there Sand a second? Sandbolt will second. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Bjornberg. Aye. Booty. Aye. Howard. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Eistrom. Aye. Sambolt. Aye. Didi. Aye. Brothers. Aye. Glad you're here. <laughs> Thank Van you. Van Dyke. <laughs> Aye. Ann Sundberg. Aye. Ten yeas and zero nays. Thank you. That motion passes. Um, I think I also need to say let the record reflect that Commissioner Struthers is here. Um, so with that, we move on to our next item. Item five is the historic waiver text amendment to chapter 599. Um, the staff report will be by Andrea Burke. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Andrea Burke and I'm the supervisor for the historic preservation team in CPED. And I am presenting tonight a text amendment to Chapter 599, the Heritage Preservation Red Light Regulations. Next slide, please. Um, and just a reminder, this is a discussion item. This is not a public hearing. Um, we did not notice for this particular item. So um, just a clarification. This text amendment was introduced by Council Member Lisa Goodman of Ward 7 as an incentive to property owners with designated historic landmarks to allow flexibility to recent standards added to Title 12 of the city's housing code under licensing. The amendment adds an administrative waiver process for designated landmarks that include dwellings with short term rental units. The timing of this amendment is tied to recent changes in December of 2020 that created a license for short term rentals, established limits on the number of short term rental units per owner and limited the number of short term rental units in buildings with over 20 units. The purpose of the amendment is to allow greater flexibility with these requirements as an incentive to historic property owners that will aid in the reuse of historic buildings within Minneapolis. Currently, the only other incentive available to designated properties in Minneapolis is the historic variance, which allows a departure of the literal requirements from the zoning code, not the licensing code, if found to further the preservation of the property. Waivers will only be permitted relative to the requirements applicable to short term dwelling units under Title 12, Section 244, um, excuse me, Chapter 244, Section 1845. So it's a, a very specific section and will not be permitted for any life safety requirements or occupancy requirements for short term dwelling units. To prevent large numbers of units being used for short term rental in historic properties, the provision was added to limit the number of short term dwelling units to more, no more than 50% of the total dwelling units in the building. The administrative findings for the waiver will be very similar to those for the historic variants and will be granted under a joint sign off between the planning director and the regulatory services director. Next slide, please. This, uh, these next few slides are just showing the, the language that is being modified, which is actually uh, fairly minor. Uh, the amendment will modify three sections to chapter 599 under definitions as shown here. Um, one mentioned to point out several years ago, we changed the language for historic variants due to a lawsuit um, to not cause 
or not condition or have a finding for a variance that's called hardship, but change the language to practical difficulties. And we had changed it in other sections in 599, but did not appear to change it under the definition. So that is correcting that particular definition for historic variance. Um, and then also adding the historic waiver um, definition, which is you know essentially um, what I had just described. Next slide, please. Um, under the duties of the planning director as shown here, the provision will be added to allow a duty for the planning director to review and make recommendations on waiver requests for individual landmarks. Next slide, please. And then under application procedures, this is where the bulk of the tax amendment has been placed. Um, essentially, it's just it is adding an application for a waiver for individual landmarks. Um, it mentions Title 12, Section 2, uh, Section 244, 1845 for an individual landmark building. Um, it states that, uh, you know, it's for the purpose of promoting the recognition, preservation and protection and reuse of landmarks. Um, no waivers shall be authorized for occupancy requirements. Um, you know, and then the, the, the findings are there as well, which are very similar to the historic variants. Um, but that is pretty much the meat of the text amendment as shown in this slide. Um, with this, the Department of Community Planning and Economic Development recommends that the Heritage Preservation Commission and City Council adopt staff findings to amend Title 23 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances as follows. Um, the text amendment to add and amend provisions related to a waiver process for designated properties and staff recommendation is to approve the text amendment to add and amend provisions. Um, this is an item where even though it's not a public hearing formally, we call these action items um, and we often use them for national register nominations when the commission does need to make a formal recommendation and in this case, a text amendment uh, is only formally adopted at council, similar to a designation. So in this case, the HPC just makes a recommendation. They provide comments. Um, they can agree or disagree with staff findings on the, the text amendment, and then it will actually get noticed for a public hearing at the business um, inspections, housing and zoning committee of the city council which happens after this meeting. So there will be a chance for public comment at this point, but I will take HPC uh, comments and recommendations to that meeting um, based on staff recommendation. But this concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions and thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Are there any questions for staff? Commissioner Howard. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thanks for explaining the change to the undue hardship to practical difficulties thing. That was gonna be my first question and I don't need to ask about that now. I guess my big question is, is this waiver is very, very specific um, related to the short term um, rentals and I'm, I'm curious are there other things ever that we might need a waiver for that um, would suggest that we should make this a little bit more flexible down the line I mean the variance uh, language that we have um, doesn't specify the specific part of zoning you know um, I'm just curious if there's anything down the line that we might uh, wish we had the ability to waiver or is that something that we just address when we get there. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. That is a good question. Um, when this came up, as I kind of mentioned with um, what the new provisions that got adopted to the code in December of 2020, I'm gonna to try to be really frank here. It essentially limits the number of short-term rental units one can have in a property and there's some other provisions of owner occupied and so on and so forth that I confess I'm not the expert on. Um, and this is a way to allow a few more for property owners as an incentive if your property is historic given sometimes the challenge in finding a suitable use for a historic resource. 
there were discussions about uh, to confirm your statement. Yes, it is very specific to short term rental units. Um, I think there was a concern about having so much of the licensing code opened for potential waivers that there might be kind of opening a Pandora's box in that respect. Um, and right now the more desired, if I wouldn't say critical issue is being able to reuse some of these historic buildings. And one of them is through short-term rental units, which is, as I noted in the staff report, a, a very popular method um, for tourism in the city. Um, but by keeping it this specific at this point in time, you know, we're kind of going into uncharted territory by opening up the licensing code. Um, as I mentioned in the staff report as well, at least in some preliminary research staff isn't aware of any other city code that allows kind of a waiver slash variance into another part of the code, in this case, the housing code. Most of the times, if there is an incentive, it is to the zoning code through a historic variance, although it can be called other things um, and sort of crossing boundaries into the, the housing code is a little bit of uncharted territory. So I think starting small is maybe a good way to go to just to see how this works. Um, so we don't have a lot of, you know, I wouldn't say unusual requests, but just so we can sort of see how this goes and how it works and um, how we might be able to, to work with it. Because right now with the zoning code, we can work with you know, our, our neighboring zoning staff and planning staff on, on requests. However, um, housing is, is a completely different section, even though we're all under CPED. And I think um, there were some concerns about opening a little bit too much in that respect. But I hope that answers your question. It does, that makes sense, thanks. Are there any additional questions for staff? don't see any at this time. Um, I did want to check to make sure that the council member or any representative for the council member is, is there anybody here to speak uh, on their side of things? Um, Chair um, Sundberg, no, they were not able to make it to the meeting tonight. Okay. Just didn't want to leave them out. Um, well, if there aren't any other questions, um, then we should discuss this. I think I like the idea of adding an incentive. I think it, it's interesting that we can't find any city precedents for doing something similar. Um, I guess I, not knowing a ton about uh, code and you know the text amendments and things like that. Um, I guess I, I just appreciate um, the, the idea of creating uh, an incentive for historic property owners. Um, and I liked the fact that it was specific to individually designated properties, it seemed like, um, as opposed to um, districts, at least that's how I was interpreting it. Um, and so I, this did seem like a, like a narrow way to start, which made sense to me. Commissioner Johnson. So I, I agree, I am not a, uh, a wonk on this code. So I guess I'm trying to still wrap my head around it because there's a lot of, um, it looks like a lawyer wrote this and <laughs> I just wanna make sure I understand what's being asked of us before I vote on it. I guess it essentially in layman's terms is we're offering an incentive to people in historic buildings or districts to for for like Airbnbs, is that what we're considering short-term rentals? Or I mean, not Airbnbs, like, but th that short, that type of um, market, is that is that what's happening? And what is, what's the in incentive? I guess I'm just not really following 100% what is being asked. So I guess I'm asking for some clarity, maybe in layman's terms, and I apologize if I'm just being dull on this. <laughs> 
Commissioner Johnson, I can answer your question. You are not, um, you have all very valid questions based on how it's written, it's kind of code speak. Essentially what you're saying is all correct. Yes, it is without lack of a better term, referring to Airbnbs and the number of Airbnbs you can get on a building based on the most recent change to the, the housing ordinance and the license that was created. Um, it is only for landmarks, so you are correct, uh, Chair Sundberg. It is not for districts um, as a way to start small. Um, and essentially, to, to put it into very basic terms, um, to help explain it, uh, kind of just what I said is a way to incentivize owners of historic landmarks to be able to have more I'm going to say Airbnbs, but it doesn't always have to be that way than than what is currently allowed by this recent code change that came into effect in December of 2020. Does that help? Uh, yeah, yes, it does. Thank you so much for for that. Yeah. Uh, sure. Commissioner Johnson, I was also imagining them as Airbnbs. That was that was the only way I was able to wrap my mind around the idea. <laughs> um, any other comments, Commissioner Howard? You know, we've been we've been begging for more incentives that we can give to to local landmark owners, and uh, this is not one that I envisioned. <laughs> so, so yay for thinking outside the box, I guess. Um, I, I'm curious about what the ramifications will be for some of these neighborhoods. You know, short-term rentals, you have tons of traffic and stuff like that, and I don't know that we we know what all of those ramifications may be. Obviously, uh, our ordinance can be amended again should we decide that it's not working the way we expected it to. Um, I'd be uh, I'm, I'm still curious as to how th this sort of thing has been handled across the country. And I don't know if um, any city staff are part of the National Alliance for Preservation Commission's listserv. Um, I know I've, I've seen Dr. Smoley comments or, or post in there. Um, it might be worth shooting some emails out to some of our colleagues to see how other people have dealt with, with this idea of a waiver and not just related to short-term rentals, but this whole idea of a waiver in general as opposed to a variance. Um, uh, but like I said, I, I'm, I'm glad we're kind of thinking outside the box. I am a little concerned about what the, the ramifications may be down the line for the, the neighborhoods surrounding these properties. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Um, Andrea, I do actually have a question, I guess, and looking at the wording more specifically. Um, so I understand that we're capping like the ratio of units in the building that can be short-term versus long-term rental. Um, do we actually, with this, I guess I'm envisioning, so like if you had a, a large mansion and you're dividing it up, into a whole bunch of short-term rental units. Is there a cap on how many, or is it simply based off the fact that they can't override health, safety, and welfare? So they have to still all be code compliant units. Because I guess I'm trying to figure out what, it, what exactly, where the line is, what, what exactly we're letting people do that they can't already do. It's a little bit, uh, thanks Chair Sumler. It's a little bit of both of what you just said. Yes, it is capping it so that no more than 50% of them can be used for short term rentals. So you don't have, let's say, per se, an entirely large mansion or you have a large apartment building and everything is going to be short term rental units because that maybe goes too far to one end of the spectrum. But it also, you know, added in some of that specific language so that there is no health safety code. This can't violate any health safety code, life safety, occupancy requirements, which are also somewhat included in that particular section, um, but that there is, there's just no way that just because you're a historic building, you can get around life safety. So I guess following up on that then, if you currently have, I guess I'm, tr I'm looking back and forth between our waiver text and the, the text that it's actually referring to in the chapter, um, how many short-term rental units is a property currently allowed to have? Not a whole lot. Okay. 
Yeah, that's I was trying I to find like a number or something. The exact number, but it, it's 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 fairly restrictive. Okay, so it, this would be a big difference to open it up. It would be a big it would be a big deal. Okay, Commissioner Johnson, I think has a question too. Yeah, just kind of following up on um, the chair's example. So, uh, property manager or property owner comes in with a mansion they want to, I don't know, renovate and and have fifty percent be short term rentals. So, so this waiver we're we're allowing them, they would you know they would be potentially be able to use um, materials that we normally wouldn't allow them to. Is that is that like what we're granting the waiver for to allow them to go against the historic guidelines for that neighborhood or that district or that specific building is that and maybe use materials they weren't um, originally allowed to use or or what what's what's the waiver actually for no it, um, thanks commissioner johnson no it wouldn't be anything for materials or anything against the guideline it is strictly basically anything in that section of 244-1845 that can be um, asked for for a waiver um, in a joint sign off between the planning director and the director of reg services provided they can meet that finding that it you know furthers essentially i'm going to summarize here but furthers the preservation of the property it's pretty much just related to use um, is kind of the crux of it um, and being able to have more short term rental units than you would be able to have in such a building under the current code with the most recent changes. But no, they would still have to. There's a provision we also added in the um, in the language that says they still need to follow all building code, zoning code, which includes chapter 9, 599, title 23, which is the you know historic heritage preservation regulation. So it's mostly just use and, and number and maybe some other items in there that are maybe granted if um, the planning director and the, the reg services director agree on it as well as, um, as well as if they can make that finding that we listed. Um, but no, it wouldn't grant any waivers to materials or go against the guidelines or they still need to meet all that too. Okay, would, thank you very much. Would this be then wavering, because I'm looking at the, the um, what was it, the 244-1845 text. Um, currently it looks like if you're not homesteaded, you have to go through a rental dwelling license process is is that one of the big like are we wavering the sort of homestead requirement you know it's a good question i don't know i don't know if it's gonna you know i think these are kind of come as we get as we get them and what some of the asks are from from property owners um and i think you know whether that homestead requirement is is kind of up to the the planning director and the the reg services director and that's why it was written fairly loosely just to be under the 244 1845 so that there is flexibility um but yes i think you know my my off the table analysis, I would say yes, but I think we don't really know yet until we see this thing in action. Okay, thank you. Um, I could definitely see somebody asking for a waiver for that to, to cut the paperwork um, down. I, I could see that being appealing. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Or would somebody like to make a motion? What would that motion be? I think it is to um, recommend to city council um, the text amendment as written by staff. Andrea, we don't have any wording on our agenda of what we're supposed to say specifically. Oh, I am so sorry. Um, which <laughs> like I said, these are these are a little oddball. Um, 
yeah, so the recommended motion as I have in the staff report is the rec, you know, I should have included the words recommend, forgive me, but recommend to approve the text amendment to add and amend provisions related to a waiver process for designated properties. And that's largely taken directly from the way the text amendment was introduced at council back in January of 2021. And if you want me to repeat that, I can, or I can type, I can put it into the chat so you can read it too. I, I think Rachel just put it in the chat Perfect. for us. Thank you, Thank you Rachel. Um, Commissioner Sandbold. I motion that we approve the text amendment to add and amend provisions related to a waiver process for the designated properties. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbold. Howard seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll on the motion? Darnberg. Aye. Woody. Aye. Howard. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Sandbolt. Aye. Davey. Aye. Struthers. Aye. Vanderike. Aye. Sundberg. Aye. That's 10 yeas and zero nays. Thank you, that motion passes. That concludes our discussion items for tonight. Um, commissioners or staff, does anyone have any announcements or additional commission business to discuss? Um, Andrea? I do. Um, thank you. Yeah, so I wanted to give an update. I know it's been a little bit of a little bit of time since we met. Um, but there we have two uh, resource, well, most recent designated properties that were accepted and, and designated at council. The Tyler Street John Cook House um, was designated by city council at the beginning of April. And then the three Mary Loughran Homes Historic District was designated also by council the middle of April. So those are final. Um, I am not sure yet what we will do with respect to the design guidelines for the three Lochran homes. I think uh, Rob and I need to kind of talk about that a little bit more. Um, but so those are final. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is just with the retreat coming up on May 20th, um, topic items. I've heard from several of you about requested agenda items for that retreat, and I'm kind of keeping a running list. Uh, but if I would say let's make a deadline of this Friday close of business for agenda item talk topics to send to me, just feel free to email them to me and I can, um, I will add them and then I'll probably, you know, depending on what we have, I'll pick and choose um, from there and I'll probably reach out to, to commissioners to see if they're okay with that, just given the a time that we have on May 20th. Um, but please think of those and send them to me and I will um, get those on the agenda. I need to finalize the agenda by, I think it's early to middle of next week. So I think the end of this Friday would be good. Um, and I think that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention, uh, we all got an email quite a while ago now that uh, the National Park Service was giving out scholarships to the Main Street Conference, and I was lucky enough to receive a scholarship. So I attended the Main Street Conference uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, all remotely, of course, and um, I can report out a little more in depth, some perhaps at our retreat, but I just wanted to mention a couple of things that stuck in my mind. And one was that there appears to be a disconnect 
um, on what the the future of preservation is. Um, and this is a, a long-standing disconnect. I could get into a long conversation about these things. Um, but uh, the National Trust is putting together uh, sort of a white paper, uh, an agenda for what direction preservation should go. So keep an eye on the National Trust to see what kind of um, direction they're proposing for preservation in general. And the other thing that I, I was really interested to, to learn more about at the conference was the Urban Main Program, which is a kind of a subset of the Main Street program. Typically a Main Street program, you're thinking a smaller town with a Main Street, one commercial district. Urban Main is for communities like Minneapolis, where we have lots of little commercial nodes. And I'm really um, starting to think about how that might be something that we could tap into um, in Minneapolis uh, for some of our little commercial uh, areas, um, especially in light of everything that's happened over the last year. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is I have newly been selected to be a, a trainer with the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions. And um, for Preservation Month, the National Alliance for Preservation Commissions is doing a bunch of online remote stuff. Uh, starting this Thursday night, there's gonna be a preservation trivia thing. Um, next week, there's going to be a webinar midday on Thursday about community outreach strategies for preservation commissions and boards. And then uh, on the 27th, uh, kind of midday again, that's another Thursday, uh, they're gonna do a webinar on 1970s and 1980s architecture. And so if you're interested, go to napccommissions.org, I believe it is, and look under news and it'll be the, the top item under news. And you can just, everything's free, you just have to register through their, their new webinar system. And I encourage you, if you have time and can attend, please do. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Um, along the, the same kind of ideas of um, webinars and preservation, um, the local branch of the AIA, which is AIA Minnesota, um, is working on its programs for the annual uh, conference on architecture. So this is like the, the big conference that many architects in the state attend. Um, they're currently doing their call for pro program proposals. Um, and I have been roped into to working on their committee, arranging the programming. And one of the topics they want speakers on is preservation. And so I was really excited to see that that hit their list of topics this year um, for that they like um, people to, to sit in on programs for. So if you have any ideas um, for either a presentation you would like to present that you think architects in the state should see, um, or a speaker you've seen at a webinar, since I know we've all had more time for webinars recently than at least I, I know I've attended a lot more. Um, if there was a speaker you saw that you think we should try to lobby to do a, a webinar for the AIA here, um, please shoot me an email because I'm looking for ideas. Um, and if you go to the AIA's website, um, you can find the call for proposals if you have an idea that you just want to like jump on it. Um, I think there are a lot of architects in this, especially maybe in the Twin Cities, as we know, they're the ones we interact with most directly, um, who maybe could could use some words of wisdom about preservation before they come before us for items. So I guess I'm thinking if there's anything you really wish they understood that it doesn't seem like they do, um, this, this is our opportunity to uh, present this information to the larger architecture community. Um, so there's, there's my call out. If anybody has any ideas, let me know. Any other announcements? I don't see any. Um, so with that, we have completed all items on the agenda for this meeting. I will again ask members and staff if there are any other matters to come before this meeting. There being no other business this meeting, if not and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. The next regular meeting of the HPC is May 18th, 2021. Thank you, everyone.